If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com backslash FPA. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. If you would like to earn continuing education credit for your FP&A certification from the Association of Finance Professionals for listening to the show, go to the show notes for details on how to earn the credit. Finally, if you enjoy listening to FP&A today, please go to your podcast platform of choice, click the subscribe button, and leave a rating and review of the show. And now, on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. And so I'm going to go ahead and start by introducing the guests I have here with me. As I mentioned, my name is Paul Barnhurst. I'm lucky enough to host this event and have three fabulous guests with me today. So why don't we start with Jeff Ignacio? Jeff, can you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? Thanks, Paul. My name is Jeff Ignacio. I'm the head of go to market growth and operations at Regrow Ag. We're a mission focused climate company uh, in the agricultural supply chain space. Uh, I've been in the revenue operations space for a good 10 years. And prior to that was an fp a at companies like Intel and at Google. Great. Thank you. Arvin, Arvin Shell, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. And first, let me say how honored I am to be on, on the panel. And I'm just excited as our listeners to, to learn from the three of you as I am to uh, participate. Currently, I'm, I'm VP Finance and Ops at Autotrader.ca. Autotrader.ca, it's a marketplace where Canadians can come to buy and sell uh, vehicles. Uh, my current role, I lead a team of six awesome people where we partner across the business to uh, ensure alignment um, between strategic, operational and, and financial goals. Uh, prior to joining Auto Trader, uh, I was in the RevOps space for about six years. I spent about four and a half years at, at Shopify, leading a couple of different RevOps teams. Uh, and before all that, I spent the first 10, 12 years of my career in uh, capital markets, quantitative finance. So I've been very blessed to have had a few different chapters and adventures in, in my career. So ha- happy to be here today. Happy to have you. We're, thank you for joining us, Arvind. Drew, why don't you go ahead and Introduce yourself. Absolutely, Paul. Uh, first off, thrilled to be on. I honestly a huge fan of yourself and also Jeff, and great to meet Arvind. I uh, just uh, stoked to be here overall. VP Revenue at SCS Cloud. We're a revenue operations and financial operations consultancy uh, doing implementations, upgrades, alignment across primarily revenue and finance teams. Um, and that's that's our mission. Seen a lot in terms of my background, uh, mostly on the consolidated go-to-market operations side. Um, originally come from uh, marketing, PR, and also as an AE. Uh, then bringing into uh, marketing operations, uh, sales operations, and then most recently at Mad Kudu um, and Hashikart. Before that, uh, a certain amount of CS ops as well. Interacted heavily with Jeff as well, uh, you know, in his capacity. Uh, you know, I, I would consider Jeff uh, a mentor to a degree and uh, stoked to be on the panel with him uh, in his capacity at uh, RevOps Co-op. Thank, thank you, Drew, for that introduction. I thought this was an yeah. interesting uh, comment we got coming in. We'll throw this up here. Kelvin's letting us know he's transitioning from RevOps to fp a as we speak. So uh, I think... Many on our panel have done that so they can relate either one way or the other from FP&A to RevOps or RevOps to FP&A. So thank you for sharing. Just to uh, mention, we have guests coming from all over the glo- all over the globe. We got Canada, Ukraine, Romania, Madrid, London, Singapore, Mexico. So keep sharing where you're coming from. Feel free to ask questions throughout our conversation. And where I want to start, and I'm going to guess anyone who especially has worked in a small company or spent a long time in FP&A has probably seen one company define RevOps this way with these tasks and sales ops with these tasks and another company differently. Maybe you've seen RevOps in fp a Maybe you've seen it sit in sales ops. Maybe you're not sure what they are and how they all work together sometimes because it can be very different from company to company. And I see some smiling from the panelists. I think they can relate to that. So why don't we start by giving each of you an opportunity to just State how you define revenue operations. What do you think of when you hear the term RevOps? And for this question, why don't we start with you, Arvind, on this one? When I think of RevOps, I really think of that function that helps keep all the different go-to-market pieces aligned. So what's in go-to-market typically? 
you know, some combination of sales, customer success, and and marketing. And so RevOps sits at the center there uh, and really makes sure that those teams have the right systems, uh, the right tooling, the right technology, the right reporting, uh, the right operating rhythms uh, to keep all those functions aligned and, and make sure that that go-to-market strategy is um, how execution against the strategy is, is occurring and, and also identify where there's opportunities to, to identify uh, new strategic opportunities. Thanks, Arvind. How about yourself, Drew? What would you maybe add to that or change from your perspective? I agree with Arvind on the majority there. I think the operating cadence is central, and I think you'll hear that probably from Jeff as well. The The main point is, is that I would divide strategic revenue operations versus uh, deep or entrenched revenue operations being uh, a split between directional or advisory level information, strategic level information, uh, forecast, capacity, planning, which is which are often owned by FP&A organizations. I would consider that strategic RevOps, whereas you have um, the aspect of entrenched or systems level RevOps being that data supply chain function that feeds those decisions, right? So they are truly interlocked. There's no way for them to exist without one or the other. Um, but how you how you organize them really depends on the organization that you are in and how that organization goes. To Thanks market. for that, Drew. I agree. Uh, Jeff, your thoughts on this? Yes, yeah, so I'm working on getting this in the Webster's Dictionary. I have an inquiry, so hopefully they'll follow up with me. Uh, but I defined it as the uh, revenue operations as the discipline of aligning go-to-market strategy and execution through four key pillars. And those four pillars are process enablement, advisory, and systems excellence. So strategy and execution, P's in a pod, P-E-A-S, process enablement, advisory, and systems. Wait, say that again one more time. I got to make sure I got it right. Enablement. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Process enablement, advisory, and systems. Got it. Process enablement, advisory, and systems. I like it. It took me a minute, but I got there. So let's go to the next question. We're going to start with uh, one here. Now that we've talked a little bit about definition, how have you typically in your career, and I use the term typically loosely, but how have you seen revenue operations, finance operations kind of working together during your career? How how have you seen that, you know, kind of the functions coordinate and work together? And Drew, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, Well, I can speak to the first question. operations role that I took on was transitioning from a director of corporate marketing at a media firm to um, to really like head of marketing operations. And I reported directly in, in that capacity to the CFO, which is really an interesting point. And I think, you know, whether that makes sense for operations to report directly to the CFO or not is really, again, dependent on the organization and kind of the, the, uh, I would say go to market savvy or maturity of the organization, right? Because in terms of a consolidated CRO role, that may make more sense. But I really enjoyed reporting directly to the CFO because of the accountability within campaign reporting, within metrics, um, alignment to finance, uh, alignment to budget, right? And and being able to really have that quick back and forth facilitated with the financial wing of the organization and then report back on findings and results to the finance org. I wouldn't say that that's typical necessarily, but I will say that that's how I started my career. And I found that that was also a really fascinating aspect um, that was echoed in a later point in my career uh, when I was at HashiCorp. You know, if you look at the go-to-market functionality that was uh, in place there and the firm ended up going public and, you know, just really had a great scale uh, period. The the organization also was headed uh, by somebody who had an accounting background. So the CEO there, right, had an accounting background. And I think that rigor in terms of the go-to-market and also the finance organization was really deeply entrenched there. And we worked very closely with finance you know, in terms of 
quota structure, commissioning, uh, you know, the alignment with, you know, we also rolled out CPQ during my tenure there. Um, and really making sure that the go-to-market organization was aligned with the capability to not only meet targets, but also meet them effectively in terms of a, a degree of variance within uh, the financial expectation. Thank you. Appreciate that, Drew. Jeff, how about yourself? Uh, so I've been at different stage firms, um, series A to B, all the way up to, um, you know, publicly traded companies. Um, and they're, they're quite different, um, at, depending on the, on the stage. So your series A, your series B, uh, there's a lot of, hey, you've got this. If you don't, don't worry, I can cover you. So, you know, you have a left fielder and a center fielder to use a baseball analogy. The ball is flying in between those two outfielders. You're both probably going to converge. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of coordination that needs to be done between uh, the two outfielders there, but so several deliverables where we overlap resource allocation, primarily around headcount planning, um, operational expenditures and tooling, uh, looking at unit economics, trying to drive customer acquisition and payback periods downwards, looking at cost of retention, cost of retaining, uh, or cost of renewal as well for the ongoing customers. So a lot of those areas, we're going to work together. So board decks, QBRs, MBRs, a lot of that re uh, executive level reporting. Then there's some tactical things that we might be working on. So closing the books, when a deal closes, you have your, some close one processes. So you're talking about deal desk, all the way to pricing quoting, making sure we're hitting the deal matrix, moving the close one. And then once we close one, you're handing it off the finance for all the invoicing and, and moving into the billing platforms. Um, other areas uh, might be um, you know, tooling. I think we've gone through a period of cutting, at least in the SaaS space. So 20% discretionary cuts across the board, across software, maybe even people. And some of that, you know, that 20% mandate doesn't really look at the specificities of how that impacts the go-to-market capabilities. And so we're trying to figure out as good stewards, you know, how can we work with our finance partners to drive those costs downwards? At the publicly traded companies, there's, there's a little bit less overlap, but it, we start to bleed over quite a bit more uh, once we're doing uh, large enterprise deals, we're in the deal room together. I'm reviewing it from a go-to-market perspective, looking at the gives and the gets in terms of negotiations. Finance is looking at it from the perspective of making sure it's kosher with all of our ability and our deal matrices. And then there's also the annual planning side of the house. Annual planning side of the house is, you know, from August through January, <laughs> uh, we are hooked at the hip. We are working together. V1 plan all the way to V22. And V22 Only final. 22? Only 22. So <laughs> don't get it twisted. If you get to 23... You're taking too long. Yeah, no, you forget. If you get to 22, you're taking too long. But I didn't say that. No, um, uh, Arvind, anything you want to add? Great, great responses from from Drew and Jeff there. Um, you know, when you asked the question, the the word that immediately popped to mind is partners. Like I said, most most of my time has been on the RevOps side, and now I'm on the other side of that PA. But I think of the two teams as working together, partnering together to ensure alignment between go to market and financial goals. Uh, when I was on the RevOps side, most of what we did, the finance team uh, was involved in some form or another, you know, similar to like what Jeff said, whether it was more tactical things like weekly metrics reviews, you know, certainly finance was there, whether it got to more uh, planning um, projects like uh, comp setting, uh, annual planning uh, and budgeting. Uh, again, RevOps and finance, uh, usually you know, partnering together, give, give you a quick anecdote of uh, what um, something that's going on right now for, for us at AutoTrader, you know, our product team, uh, they're thinking about making some changes to the product roadmap in, in the back half of the year. Uh, and, and that puts some of our revenue, uh, budgeted revenue at risk. So my team and the RevOps team were working to identify, well, based on the changes in that product roadmap you know what's the revenue at risk uh with the commercials uh, uh the commercials of the product changing um and then what's the plan to sort of plug plug the hole how are we gonna migrate customers from that one product to the, to the new product you know how much do we think we'll successfully migrate which ones might might there be churn which ones can we give some offers to to, mm -hmm. to try and save etc cetera, etc cetera, right so you know there's a there's a problem that the finance team has identified and we're partnering with the with the RevOps team to figure out, okay, how are we going to manage this, this risk? And, and is there even a op new opportunity because of this change? 
thank you for sharing that. And so, you know, a couple things that we we have heard in our conversation so far. One, it's critical for RevOps operations, FP&A to be coordinating, to work together. The second thing you're hearing is it's going to be different depending on size, company, and leadership. The tasks have to get done, but exactly how it's distributed will vary a little bit. But the, the key message, and I think we'll come back to this again and again throughout this conversation, is the importance that we're all working together and that we're all coordinating and that there are some clear differences between the tasks, even though at times they can be blurred or a little overlap. I want to ask a question here. So I had, I don't know how many people may know him, but I had Scott Stouffer. I think you know who he is, Jeff, right? Right. So he's been a CEO, I think about five companies now from beginning to public. And we had quite a conversation around RevOps. And he shared that he thinks RevOps should be under FP&A if, you know, analytics and deep analysis really the focus is what you need from that go-to-market team. He did say, though, if you have a really strong CRO, someone who's more than just a sales leader, that a lot of times in small companies, you see a CRO who really just manages sales. They don't know marketing and the other areas. He said, if that's the case, or if your focus is really around the tech stack, it makes sense to have it under the CRO. So I'm just curious. We'll start with you, Jeff. What's your perspective on that? How do you how do you think about that? Yeah, I always think the org question is a little bit of a a mislabel, uh, misnomer, right? So what you want go to market to do is have the ability to push back and inform decisions grounded in data that tell a story and a narrative, but it's informed by the data within your organization, or at the very least, bringing in third-party benchmarks that are relevant to your peer set. And that's from the data side of the house. From the process side of the house, you're playing the role more of an oper a chief operating officer to the go-to-market organization. So revenue rhythms, operating cadences, making sure that you're running forecast calls, pipeline calls, win-loss reviews on a regular cadence that then bring in the right data pack, the revenue rhythm, uh, and the right feedback loops that then allows you to adjust the organization in real time. That can happen under both banners. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be under the CFO or the CRO. I just think it has to be able to, one, de-conflict the areas of interest and play a lot of offense on the areas where go-to-market can be, go-to-market ops can be completely helpful. So on the sales process improvement, marketing process improvements out of the house, bringing in the right data, the right data in real time has to be for some organizations like front and center on a daily or weekly cadence. Now, if you're in the finance org facing with the go-to-market org, that daily or weekly frequency can be hard to come by because you're not necessarily embedded deep within the go-to-market team. So I've seen, uh, I ran a poll on LinkedIn recently, 300 responses, so N300, and over 50% of responses said they reported to the CRO. Um, and then another 13% reported to CL. So you're talking about you know, five eighths of individuals reporting to the revenue organization. Mm -hmm. And I think that works for many companies. Makes sense. And I think you make a good point, a little bit of a misnomer. It's really more about, do you have alignment than who should own what, right? I see everybody shaking their head. That's really the most important thing. Like I've also heard the uh, conversation, who should own data analysis? Like it can be in IT, it can be in finance. I can make an argument for both. I think there's a real argument for finance, but I get, totally sitting elsewhere. It depends on the leadership and what makes sense for your company. And so you, know, yeah. you bring up the key point to that whole question. And it's really about, are you guys aligned? And is the work getting done? And are you de-risking the conflict and working together versus this is my territory, so to speak? Arvin, any thoughts you want to add to that? No, I, I, mean, I think I think Jeff, um, you know, ra raised a really great point that it's less about where it sits in the org and making sure that the, the function is operating whether to to hit on its mandate. If I had my default way, it would be in, in a CRO's house, um, to, to Jeff's point, because I think it makes it a little bit easier for a RevOps team to get um, you know, that time with their their go-to-market counterparts. Uh, and and then they can still be partnering with with other teams across the org, like the finance team, for example. But you know, every RevOps team starts somewhere. Uh, they, they're not just emerging as some fully functioning, uh, mature group of people. 
I've definitely seen or heard of RevOps teams, yeah, starting in the finance function or even starting in like a marketing function or something like that, right? So they're probably going to start somewhere and where they start is probably going to dictate where a lot of the initial strengths and focuses of the team is. But I think the, the point is as the org grows and matures and evolves, the RevOps function needs to grow and mature and, and evolve as well. And then you've got to think about, well, where where is the place that, where's the right place in the org for this function to sit or or these you know collection of functions to, to sit so that it can hit on its mandate. I appreciate that. You know, we have a lot of great conversation going on in the chat. I'm not going to read through all of it, but I thought, you know, Ahmad, interesting here also depends on what the CR owns. You know, this gets back to what I said, if the CRO only own sales, for example, and not all revenue. RevOps may be pressured to be less neutral and more biased. I think, you know, there's some validity to that. I like this one. If CRO only owns sales, they are an inflated VP of sales. We've never seen that at a company, right? Because everybody nods their heads and right. laughs. Just just chuckles. Well, if you call, so, uh, if you call a CRO glorified sales leader and you call, then you can call RevOps a glorified revenue IT shop. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a little facetious with yeah. labeling. Yeah, it, it is. But I mean, you know, you do see times when CRO is really just focused on sales versus the owning the whole thing. And so you just got to think through all of it, I think is the main thing. I like that there, Kelvin. Spicy. I like it. All right. So we're we're going to move on past that question to, a, to the next one here. This one's for you, Drew. So, you know, obviously as a consultant, you work with a lot of different companies. What do you see as the key challenges to ensure that RevOps, FP&A, that they're on the same page and they're working together. Have you seen any kind of key issues or trends there when dealing with companies? So I've, uh, you know, it, and I think it's exacerbated too because I, I work largely in the mid-market um, and, you know, those companies, uh, a lot of private equity owned shops that are, you know, really trying to get their financial rigor in place, their accountability in terms of, you know, target attainment in place, things of that things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, as Jeff spoke to, the unit economics really become a focal point. A couple of stories, and I'm you know, trying to anonymize them as best I can. <laughs> um, but I had one interaction where I was speaking to a CFO and a head of FP&A only, and brought up the point of RevOps, brought up the point of alignment to their CRM, and also their sales and go-to-market organization overall. And it was the strangest response I'd ever heard was, well, we don't really care about the data quality on the actual CRM. We don't care about you know, how that's all working for the sales organization directly because we've built it into the close, the, it, literally the close of the books and the model would just account for all of these errors. And the person who had basically built the model on the FP&A side was just accounting for all of these random variables. And I was like, well, that sounds really nice in terms of your direct mandate, but I wouldn't want to work at that sales organization either. Uh, and having, you know, myself, I mean, as a seller myself now, and also as a go-to-market person overall, right? Because I do care about marketing. I do marketing every day. I, you know, I'm also very involved in our customer success process. I just kind of went, that, that sounds like a real rough scenario for the actual experience of that data supply chain, the systems and the visibility within the go-to-market organization overall. So that was a very interesting experience there. Um, I'll also say that I think if one of one of the points that I think FP&A, uh, especially in consumer product and uh, health and beauty, that's a strong category for us, um, they often own the allocation, right? And unless that's well coordinated with the marketing organization and some of that actually sits within marketing, those allocations, they can be misallocated effectively, right? Because the model might not be correct. Um, and making sure that there is really strong, uh, I mean, this goes back to my very early career was in 
consumer products and direct marketing was, you know, the aspect of being able to take the campaign performance and directly turn that around on a fast basis and get the new allocation established in order to optimize that budget and potential marketing performance as well, just in terms of your your Romy and your ROAS. So those those points are really interesting um, at the top of the funnel. Yeah, and one thing you said there really struck with me as you shared, hey, we don't care what they do, we just fix it all on the back end. Right. <laughs> if you're doing that, stop and have the conversations. You may have to continue to do it for a time. I've done it. I've fixed a lot sure. of things on the back end, but you always need a long-term, hopefully short-term strategy to fix it on the front end. Cause it makes no sense to be like, you can have all your data wrong. We don't care. We'll get it right <laughs> over here. So they're doing analysis on data that's wrong and you're doing it on analysis that's right. And then what happens, you get into a, a meeting and Joe says, I have 1.2 million for CAC. And Pete says, I have 1 million. You spend the whole time fighting about right why it's right or wrong versus accomplishing anything. And I can see Drew laughing. I'm sure Jeff can relate to that one as well. So that that would be my comment there is always try to fix the the data at the source. I have been in roles. I worked in an FP&A role where my whole role was coordinating between sales ops and rev ops and trying to help fix everything in Salesforce. And I was constantly talking to them versus, I'll just figure out how to fix this on the back end. So I appreciate yeah. you bringing that one up. So we're going to shift here a little bit. You know, Jeff, you mentioned this earlier, but I want to go back to it. You mentioned the four pillar, the four uh, pillars for RevOps, right? Process enablement, advisory, and systems. Why are why are those the four pillars in your mind? Why why are those the four key things? I think the original triangle that folks will say often uh, with any sort of center of excellence is going to be people, process, and technology. And mm -hmm. I think we've gone away from using the word center of excellence, but a lot of what go to market does truly harkens back to those days of center of excellence. And, you know, really borrowing from people, process, and technology. However, I do think there's something that's missing, which is the concept of decision making. And that's where I, I think advisory comes into play. And it goes beyond, you know, cleaning up the data. That's table stakes. Getting to a place where you can perform analysis, deriving insights, not only deriving insights, but also marrying that with the business acumen to then be a revenue leader unto yourself and partnering with your sales, product, and marketing leaders so that you can you know, achieve those outcomes that you're looking for. So it's really racing up the data maturity and the decision maturity curve. And then there's also the enablement piece. So I think a lot of times folks can make some changes on the process side of the house or the system side of the house and not necessarily communicate that effectively to the team. So change management, driving new behaviors, removing bad habits from the organization, that has to be part of, I think, what a qualified go-to-market organization uh, can do uh, for kind of the modern, you know, kind of hyper growth phase of the company. And so that's why I believe that enablement and advisory are two key pillars. And then process and systems are, have always been there. Um, I didn't include people. I, I just figured that's obvious, but um, <laughs> and I, was all, I was also trying to fit a mnemonic piece in a pod. Uh, so that's also why I went with those four pillars. I think, yeah, I think those, those pillars can apply to finance as well. Um, you know, finance has processes, um, that just help people understand how the business is performing. Uh, the fi finance team can partner with other groups, product team, marketing team, like whoever, enable them with a little bit more fi financial um, uh, fluency, help help them understand how, how their business is, their part of the business is performing and, and affecting the overall company. There's there's obviously they had an advisory piece of it uh, where where your, the finance team is working with with leaders to, to help them make strategic decisions, decisions, and then of course you've got uh, you know systems all over the place to to collect and consolidate data to to help you with your analysis. So I love I love that that framing that Jeff has developed for for RevOps and and I think really astute finance leaders will actually see their function in a very very similar way and figure out how uh, how their function how their finance function can add value in those four pillars as well. Yep. All right. So I'm going to go here to a few questions. I think that's triggered some questions from people. So Bill asks, and this is shifting a little bit, and then we'll go to the next one. He asks, what are the typical bad behaviors you've seen in a go-to-market org? And I see Drew chuckling a little bit. 
Um, I'm curious, you know, Arvin, maybe your take. What are some of those things you see that you've seen done that you're just like, why are we doing it this way? Outside of a messy sales force, right? Does anyone have a clean sales force? <laughs> I was going to say that, yeah, the first one that came to mind is just like bad reps, uh, uh, <laughs> habits of, of uh, entry and stuff. But hey, that's that's like on the RevOps team then to figure out like, yep. hey, how do we reduce the the overhead of, of data intake? You know, I think one bad habit of, of any go-to-market org is start doing like finger pointing. And, you know, the sales team is pointing at marketing saying, oh, you're not giving us enough leads or doing enough demand gen or blah, blah, blah. Our marketing is saying, hey, we're throwing you stuff, but you're not doing anything with it. At the end of the day, uh, we're all responsible for for revenue. And and yeah, we've got, you know, our part of it. Marketing got their part of it. Sales got their part of it. Customer success got their part of it. But like, if if the leads that are coming through and sales is feeling like they're not quality, like marketing and sales has to figure that out together. That's not a marketing problem. That's not a sales problem. That's that's a go to market org problem. So that's I think that's a, a bad habit that I've seen a few times where people just try to point the fingers and and forget that you're all one go to market team. You know what it is like. Thirteen different spreadsheets emailed out to twenty three different budget holders. Multiple iterations, version control, errors back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. I see two really good points in there. One, the data. That's often, you know, you see bad habits around data and who's responsible for it inputting it. I think the second, which is a major cultural problem, and I'd say is more important, is when you start getting into finger pointing, right? If people aren't aligned and they're not working together, doesn't matter if your data is good or not. You're going to have a lot of problems, right? You got to have that cultural understanding that I am responsible for helping the team be successful. Jeff and Drew, anything either of you would like to add to that? I'll name a few. <laughs> All right, go for um, it, Jeff. Yeah, uh, I'm sure this has never been done by any of the folks uh, who are on the channel. Um, selling outside of the menu. So <laughs> typically your business, it doesn't operate like in and out. I'm assuming there's no secret menu. The gummy bear milkshake, uh, bypassing discounting policies, right? Just willy nilly handing out discounts without any checks, uh, <laughs> focusing on the wrong channels, not following up with leads, not tracking renewals, focusing on the wrong segments, playing first class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good list. Amazing. So I'll, I'll Amazing. share one I ran into at a, we had one where, our Salesforce had been set up in such a way I had to approve as the director of FP&A any deals over a certain percentage. And I just got promoted. I got my first deal. One of the first ones I got and I denied it because we were going to lose, it like made no sense. I'm like, why did you sell it at this price? And I immediately get a call from the sales guy. Well, the customer's already signed the contract. I'm like, wait, wait a second. I haven't even approved it. He's like, yeah, we can print them before you approve it. I'm like, so why am I rubber stamping this? Like, what's the point here? And I immediately went to our ops team and said, okay, we need to fix Salesforce. And I told the salespeople, yeah, we're not, we're not doing that game anymore. But I did it in a way where I said, come to me if you need to do a discount. Let's discuss what makes sense. Help me understand what you're doing with this customer. Not just, okay, it's 15%. No, you know, not just trying to be the no person, but really working with them. And it, it ended up being a really good thing in the long term because I developed some great relationships with our sales team. And they started to realize I was a resource to help them, not a hindrance. 
But initially they weren't, they were pretty mad at me. They were not happy because they were being allowed to pretty much do whatever they wanted. And I'm like, yeah, it's not, not a good idea. Right. But I tried to not do it in a finger pointing way. Like, what are you guys doing? It's like, how do we solve this together? So that was a good learning for me. Just when you said that, Jeff, it reminded me of that experience. All right. So if we, we move on here, I want to ask a kind of a little bit of a different question for you, Jeff. I think you're the one here that went from FP&A to RevOps. Why'd you make, what What uh, brought you to make the change? Why did you switch? Prior to finance, I, I was in sales. So I wore the bag, uh, I wore a bag and, um, you know, I thought, for sure, I was never going to go back into supporting the sales organization or be anywhere close to go to market. So I ended up going to business school, pivoted to FP&A. And sure enough, at Google, I was the sales FP&A partner. And I remember asking myself, how did I get here? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, you know, it's fine. I started enjoying the role. And I partnered so much with the sales operations team that, quite frankly, we were doing a lot of, we had a lot of overlap. We talked about this earlier within the hour. And uh, quite frankly, I you know found a lot of joy in what I was doing. So um, made the switch to uh, sales operations a year later at a hyper growth company. There, I you know brought a lot of what I did in finance. So a lot of data analytics, um, taught myself some, t- some hard skills like SQL, BI, uh, you know, really getting the data out of uh, you know, a raw database and then surfacing those insights and working face-to-face with the, the sales organization to get closer to the customer. I actually wanted to get more towards the tr- strategic side of the org and the acquisition side of customers. And I thought sales operations was a natural extension, but there's not a day that goes by even now, 10 years later, where I don't leverage a lot of the skills that I developed during my FP&A days. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And I'll add two thoughts here. You know, one, I, I've said this a number of times on LinkedIn. I encourage anyone working in FP&A to try to get at least at one time during your career a role outside of FP&A. I think operations is a great place. It just gives you appreciation for the rest of the business that if you spend your whole time in finance, you often don't get. And I imagine Jeff could tell some stories having seen both sides of that. And the second thing he's mentioned a couple of times and others have the importance of insights. And there's a quote I love from uh, former uh, Jim Cook, former CFO of Netflix. He said, remember, your product is not a spreadsheet. Your products are the analysis and insights you provide. And I think sometimes we get so focused on the, the spreadsheet and what we're building that we forget the purpose. And so I think you brought up some really good points there. So next question I have here is for you, Arvind. You know, something we often see, I think a real challenge we see is making sure we're all defining and reporting metrics the same way, right? You see, sales may have one thought, marketing may have another, customer service, finance, et cetera. Anything you can share with us, any advice on how you go about making sure they're aligned? Yeah, you know, when when we're talking about a metric, I think there's sort of three three who's to it. Uh, there's who defines it, who reports it, and who's accountable to it. And ideally, it's not the same team or same person that's that's doing all three. Um, uh, you know, you, hopefully, there's a little bit of a, a separation there. Uh, but you know, I think the defining it and and reporting it to that team's the same. That's fine. But um, I think the first step is to define on those sort of three, you know, three areas. Who's who's the owner? Who's who's the person who's who's going to be defining it? Who's going to be reporting it? And and ultimately, who's accountable to that metric? So, you know, super quick, simple, simple example: something like uh, I don't know, weighted weighted pipeline. Um, you know, maybe it's the RevOps team defining uh, how the weighted pipeline gets calculated, uh, and then it's the maybe the RevOps team or the data data team. They're actually you know, building up the reporting uh, infrastructure around it, and and then ultimately, it's it's the sales team that is sort of accountable to uh, the size of the pipeline versus revenue targets. So, I think having that common understanding of, well, for a metric, who's the person who's who's actually owns the definition of it? Uh, who who are we entrusting with giving us accurate reporting on it, and and they're keeping on top of the the data systems, uh, or the data supply chain? I think Drew keeps saying I like that term, um, uh, and and I'll, and who's responsible for 
how that metric's performing. Having clarity on those, I think, helps keep everyone aligned on on ensuring you're looking at and defining reporting metrics the same way. I appreciate that, Arvin. I really like how you broke that down into the three buckets, the defining, the reporting, the accountability, and the importance of not having it all sit with the same person, right? Having what we want to call separation of duties in finance often, right? Drew, I see you nodding your head a lot. What? Any thoughts or anything you want to add to that? It's actually a cross between systems or process systems and the enablement aspect of things is really having a structured data dictionary within your organization. I mean, really at an actionable level, that is something that I find missing all the time or something that's grossly out of date. So much so that recently, uh, from an advisory perspective, I engaged with a client and and it was the first thing I brought up. Like their pre-revenue, they're, they're actually pre-processed to a large degree, but they do have a PLG function. And I immediately said, look, what's what's your data dictionary in terms of the product tracking and the tags and making sure that you know, your naming convention is tight, you know, your actual definition of what all of those things are so that you can do aggregations and roll-ups and actually start to track product-led growth metrics accordingly, right? And then that builds into, of course, your modeling later on, right? Because you're looking at the bridge between product-led uh, growth overall to self-serve conversion uh, or, or self-serve pay to uh, eventually a product-led sales model, right? Where you're bridging to the enterprise motion after that. And I think all of those things, I mean, really one of the most critical steps is just data dictionary, making sure that you have those data points tagged, aligned, mapped out, and everybody knows. What Since you've been uh, our fun one to discuss data dictionary, we're going to throw this question your way, Drew. Should the data dictionary be like Wikipedia or Webster's? If the latter, who owns it? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think it should be like, it should be a, a combination of the two. So I would say that, you know, if you have a relatively decentralized organization, it should be like Wikipedia with a re, with a review function, right? Where you have somebody who is the ultimate arbiter of acceptance or uh, qualification, right? And I would say that that needs to be probably at the C level. Right. Because, I mean, you know, it finally rolls up there. But of course, like tracking all of those specific points. And I think it could also, you know, a strong VP RevOps um, could definitely take that role and say, like, no, this is what everything means. And this is the tiebreaker. And this is how we're going to adjudicate the final definition. So there needs to be an official final document, but it could be crowdsourced in terms of the the base level documentation. I agree you could do the base level, but at the end of the day, you need somebody who owns it and says, hey, this is the final definition. So I think ultimately it's more like Webster in that someone has sure. to own what that true definition is. But I think without having a little bit of that Wikipedia where people can comment and provide their input, it's hard to get buy-in. 100%. I can still remember one company I joined and we were trying to switch to be more of a SaaS business and having the conversation of just trying to align with the CFO and the CRO and a bunch of people, what a booking was. Yeah, you'd think something as simple as that would be easy. No, there were all kinds of definitions for a booking. And so it's really important to have those conversations and make sure people are heard because it can be a real challenge. But, you know, one thing it leads to is the data dictionary and good data is even more important today as we see more and more AI coming because AI relies on lots of data. And so I'm curious to get all of your guys' thoughts on the panel here. How do you see AI impacting the operations function maybe today? What have you seen, you know, kind of in the last year? And then how do you think about it in the future? And then if you're using it, maybe just a little bit of how. So I guess on this one, we'll start with you, Drew. I actually think that, you know, somebody who's who's dug in on this more than any of us is actually Jeff. Um uh, I saw some interesting posts from him recently uh, on this exact point, but I will I'll speak to one point, which is enablement. Enablement is probably going to shift in a direction of using, you know, taking that brain trust of the organization if it's codified at a reasonably structured level, and 
you would probably see more and more enablement level GPTs across an organization, right? So that pillar of revenue operations, I think, will largely move in that direction. Um, and I think that'll be great in terms of just data distribution and democratization, access to that information overall. Um, but that's that's probably the primary point that I see becoming largely automated in the near term with uh, generative AI, at least. Okay. And we'll go to Arvin here next, and then we'll finish with Jeff. Arvin, what are your thoughts on this? AI is going to help just open up um, time and capacity uh, for, for, for people where you can get a lot of the the lower value activities out of the way through through AI, and and you can start uh, leveraging AI to to answer some uh, some insightful questions. So I gave the example of um, earlier where oh our product team uh, is changing the roadmap in the back half of the year, and that's, that introduces some revenue risk. So um, I can I can see you know leveraging AI to be a bit of that advisory function that. Jeff's talked about before that. Hey, we've got this revenue at risk. These are the, some of the parameters of the situation. What are what are some potential options that the team team team, team should explore? So that's that's one. And then um, one one area where where I've been pushing my team uh, on leveraging AI is just skill development, where I've got them to develop some scripts in VBA and in, in Python. Folks who haven't done that type of work before. Um, and, and I've challenged them and, and I've said, Hey, you know, here's a couple of, you know, relatively, uh, against low, low, low value tasks that, that I think you, you folks do, um, that could be automated a little bit more, uh, just go to chat GPT, describe what you needed to do, ask it to, to produce some code in Python or VBA, uh, and, um, you know, start automating some of your work. So, um, that's how my team has been leveraging it is, is in just, um, short short circuiting the uh, the learning curve of um, uh, developing some some new skills, uh, where when they identify some opportunities for for automation or, or some need for some code development, um, uh, they they get they get eighty percent of the way there in like half an hour by leveraging uh, like ChatGPT or something like that. Yeah, no, it's a great way to use it is definitely to uh, shorten the learning curve. It can definitely help with that. Jeff, what are you seeing? What's your thoughts? Yeah, so I've had the pleasure of actually interviewing quite a few founders in the AI space, particularly for my newsletter. But ultimately, I think what this leads to is increased worker productivity. <clears throat> so, for example, the amount of ARR that a CSM can support, the number of accounts that a sales rep can prospect into, um, the amount of lines of code that an engineer can produce and push into production. So you just think about those ratios, what we classically viewed as you know heuristics for whatever work use case that is, those ratios are probably going to start moving up. Now, the question is, is it going to be incremental or is it going to be exponential? And those are the curves that just don't, I'm not quite sure. But you can make the argument that certain engineers today with the, with the aid of AI in their GitHub repo or in their code editor, you could probably be 4x more productive. You could probably push more codes than ever before. And maybe we see that up and down, different roles in finance and, and in rev ops. And I know right now we're talking about LLM as a model, but at some point these models are going to turn the street and you're going to be able to do real math in a meaningful way at scale in a lot of these models. So a couple of use cases that I've toyed around with, um, content creation, both internal and external, internal documentation, training, knowledge bases, um, even something as small as description and help text fields inside of your Salesforce. External, a lot of folks are now trying to prospect with AI. In fact, when you go into a chatbot for customer service, you're probably not going through a decision tree anymore. You're probably interfacing with some sort of uh, AI that's now taking the context of what you said and blending it with the right data points, cookie tracking, for example, and then sending it down to the right knowledge base or channel. Uh, next, research and context. The hardest working intern is a term that I've thrown around quite a bit. They may not get it right, but hey, it does the amount of research and a fraction of the time mm -hmm. and 70, 80% good enough. Um, I've used it for an account scoring project. I can't use you know, data providing tools to get the data insights that I need to score my accounts. And so I've just fed it PDFs and URLs and it's done the work for me. I've mentioned co-pilots, so debugging. If you've ever wrote a complicated if statement and 
side of Excel, or if you're doing a, you're writing a complex query on a data editor, um, it could debug it and probably shrink it by a factor of two or three. And then at the application layer, there are tools being built that are not just sprinkling AI on top of their tooling, but you're talking about unlocking true natural language processing, the ability to speak out loud and then have the AI listen, speech recognition, and then turn it into the results you're needing and feed fetch the reports you want. And then not only that, I think these um, no-code, low-code, seamless workflow builders are only going to get built better. With Thank you, Jeff. I think there's a lot of great points there. And the reality is it's here. It's here to stay. It's making us more productive. It will continue to do so, whether it's RevOps, FP&A, marketing, sales, engineering, product. And if you're not learning how to use it, you're missing out. I think that's just the reality of it today. So we're coming up near the end of our time. If anyone else has any questions, please throw those in the chat now. We'll try to get to a few of them. So I have two more questions for each of you. And the first one here we're going to ask is, what is your favorite function or feature in Excel? This is something we ask all our guests. So you're all going to get it. Hmm, should I pick on first? We'll start with you, Jeff, on this one. I don't even use Excel. I use Google Sheets. <laughs> Come on, um, you've used Excel in your career, though. Oh, you did work for Google. Fine. What's your favorite feature or function in Google Sheets? Uh, I have a few. So um, I'm a big fan of the query function, big fan of um, filter, uh, and then comp combining it with filter, unique, and count. I use unique and count a lot. Not so much filter, but yeah, the, the, I use filter a fair amount, just not that combination. That's a great one. Appreciate that. And yes, uh, we have Ezra saying pivot tables and concatenate. Feel free to add yours in the chat, what your favorite one is. We always like to see them. Arvind, how about you? I know a lot of your guests like to, to mention like a lookup function. Um, so I won't, I won't repeat that. But if, if you remember, I said I started my career in quantitative finance. And a lot of quantitative finance is built on uh, a form of modeling called uh, stochastic modeling. So mm -hmm. trying to model... Uh, random processes. Um, so I've I've actually built a lot of stochastic models uh, in Excel. I, I wouldn't recommend them for any production uh, purposes, but you know, for little hack jobs, uh, just kind of getting some directional analysis of of things, or or just getting a, even a production process off the ground. Excel is still pretty reasonable for building stochastic uh, models, and so. You know, just by using uh, the RAND function, and uh, I can't remember if it's norm, norm s inverse or norm s dist, uh, but you know, combination of those two, and, and you can basically create a stochastic uh, model all on your own, all in Excel. So I'll go with uh, uh, yeah, the stochastic modeling functions um, in Excel. Yeah, that's the first time I like Sheets. it. You can you can do the same thing Google Sheets do. <laughs> we'll cover both of them. Drew, how about you? I think it's not necessarily a favorite, but I will say like something that I I kind of used again very recently, and I think it's underappreciated is just trim. You know, I like <laughs> honestly like was like so annoying that I was like, oh good trim, okay fine, thank, thank goodness. Um, so I I kind of want to just like you know uh, call out the the humble trim function, uh, and then uh, also. Um, I think a feature of Excel that, you know, I I think if you're trying to do sort of pilot level um, pilot level dashboards or or design like a pre preliminary dashboard or something like that is uh, sparklines are a great function. So, you know, I I'm a big fan and, you know, it takes it gives you a little bit more visual candy than just having, you know, a bunch of numbers in a row. Um, and so I, I'd call that Park out. lines is a great one. Trim. I love the other day I was dealing with one and used a trim, didn't clean it up. You know, you're thinking it's a space and it's a special character. So wrapping trim <laughs> with clean you know, around the sure. whole thing to get it to work. So it will take out those special characters. So that's one of my favorites, wrapping things with trim and clean and converting it. So it's actually a number all in one, one formula everybody's nodding okay. there. I think they can relate to that one. All right. So we're going to give Drew one question here that we got asked by Christopher. And then we're going to go to our last question. We just have three minutes left. This one was specifically <laughs> for you. Uh, that's a great and one. I got to read uh, it. So, our, cause we will, you know, not everybody yeah. will hear this. So 
he, he asked, what's the harder metric to improve? GRR are watts per kilogram. And I'm sure there's something behind this. Well, I mean, my my second job as a competitive cyclist on on my weekends uh, is what it's referencing, and and watts per kilogram, of course, being the the amount of energy output according to kilogram of body weight. Uh, and you know, I will say uh, on a micro, let, I'll give you a kind of it depends answer. Um, so uh, it depends isn't so, allowed on a podcast. You got to pick a side. Right, okay, fine, okay, fine. So then, if I'm gonna pick, if I have to pick the the harder one to improve in a short term in the short term is GRR. But the harder one to probably maintain in the long run <laughs> is watts per kilogram. Because we uh, as an athlete, you you lose fitness three times as fast as you gain it. So uh, I actually was just at our company on site this week. It was great, you know, totally awesome in terms of the relationships and you know our our overall strategy for the year, effectively wrapping up an operational kickoff with a with a uh, sales kickoff. But yeah, I've, I lost some fitness this week, so uh, I'm going to call that out. <laughs> All right. Well, we had some fun with that. So we have just one minute left. So I'm going to quickly go around with this uh, last question here. We'll start with you, Jeff. If you could give one piece of advice on how FP&A and operations can work better together, what would it be? Just one piece. Communication. Communication. Arvind. Uh, empathy for operators. I like it. Drew. Uh, I think building on top of those two is consideration. Um, and what I mean by that is really just really trying to stack on top of empathy and communication that reality of how it is within that area. Um, so, you know, taking it maybe one step further and that cross training, cross functional aspect is super critical. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate that. I love that communication, the empathy, the, you know, building on top of it there, the things that were mentioned, there's a lot of human element to all this and keep that in mind. You're dealing with people, not just systems. And again, thank you for joining us, Jeff, Drew, Arvin. If our guests want to get in, get a hold of any of them, you can find them on LinkedIn. I know they're all out there. So feel free to reach out to them. And thanks again for joining us today.